I am the last person who should be speaking to you. I was half an hour late because I couldn't work with Google Maps this morning. So I, I'm coming from a really different place um, in the conversation about augmented reality and virtual reality, but I'm kind of just here to talk about reality, specifically about climate reality. Um, our company is called The Only Animal, and we do work in part for solutionary outcomes to the climate crisis. And one of the things, so I'm going to assume you guys have some basic climate literacy because you're people and you're on Facebook and you open articles every once in a while. But, <clears throat> for example, um, we talk a lot about the, a, a livable planet being 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature raise. Who knows where we are right now? I think we're at 1.1 right now. Who knows if we stay on the track that we're on, how much the planet is meant to warm? If we're on the if we stay on the emissions track, we're on. More than four. More than four in our lifetimes. So it is hard to live in a reality where everything that we're doing is connected with that, right? The IPCC report um, uh, from the last one in 2019 said that in 2020, our emissions for a livable planet, 1.5 degrees, our emissions have to, that has to be the peak. This year that we're in, we're in February of this year, this has to be the peak, and then we have to begin a decline. So <clears throat> how do we create? from that reality. Um, I think a lot of us get super tied up in our individual carbon footprints. So do you know in line with a livable planet what an individual's carbon budget should be? What we're experiencing here is the failure in climate communications, right? We all know how to recycle because an incredible amount of effort went into training us how to recycle but I'm here in a group of people. How many of you have graduate degrees? Raise your hands. And we don't know what a, an individual carbon budget is for a livable future. Um, somebody knows, who knows? Six tons. Uh, so I think it's six, um, the number that I use is two tons because that, it does the global averaging, but you're, you're climate well-educated. Right, because he's able to, like we're having the negotiation about, well, which set of data are you using? And at, for us to be useful in this climate reality, we have to have this climate literacy to be able to have these discussions. It's so bizarre, I'm talking to you within this symposium about this, but let's keep going. Um, so what is the carbon impact, or what's the carbon usage for me to fly from Vancouver to London and back in tons? So it's two tons for a yearly budget for an individual. What is it to fly to London and back? Five tons. Now, I am not here um, to inflict you with carbon guilt. We all have carbon guilt, <laughs> and that's not useful. It's, useful. it's useful for me, personally, to try to live in reality. And I run a theater company. What is a theater company's carbon budget? Is a ridiculous question, because companies don't get carbon budgets. Just humans. Humans on Earth, carbon-based life forms, get carbon budgets. But companies, ExxonMobil, the only animal, do not get carbon budgets. They are part of my carbon budget. And the moment when I realized this, totally turned my head inside out. I am sharing my carbon budget with my company. And, you know, like we have one other part-time employee, so it gets some of his carbon, and I hire a bunch of contractors and gets teeny tiny bits of their carbon budgeting. But I'm so responsible. And um, I think Ian is going to speak about what the carbon impact of digital technologies are, because it's not nothing. Um, but... I'm also here to present the idea that we should have 20% of our focus on our individual carbon footprint because we are not going to get there by washing out our plastic bags. It is not going to get us there. And 80% of our focus 
these brilliant minds in this room is on creating systemic change. And when I'm looking at the Wet'suwet'en protests that are going on, I am seeing how difficult it is to create systemic change. And I know that the people in this room are the good guys. I know that because I have done a lot of online dating recently. <laughs> and the people who are not artists are really not worth talking to. <laughs> it's you guys. It is you guys. I'm serious about this. <laughs> <laughs> and a real failure at online dating, but um, so on the, list. On the, the list of failures, the list of failures. <laughs> Kendra Fanconi's online dating. I'm so glad this is being broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> Swipe right on your screen right now, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, <clears throat> how do we contribute significantly to systemic change? So I, I am, as like the climate theater poster child of Canada right now, um, which is not a title that I feel like I come honestly to, just one that I sometimes, uh, the cap that I wear when I sit around the tables. But I'm in these conversations with the other people who are creating the climate narrative, with scientists, with journalists, with academics. Um, and what those, uh, even faith leaders, um, uh, leaders of organizations um, who work with newcomers to Canada, I'm in those conversations, and what they are all saying to me is, we need the artists. How do we get artists? We need artists on our team. Because guess what's boring and depressing? Anything about climate. It is so hard to grapple with. Like, I do it. Like, I open the article about whatever wildlife situation we're in or about IPCC or whatever. I start to read it. I start to panic. And I just say, I'm going to leave that tab open on my computer, and I'll get back to it later. Maybe you are braver than me. Maybe you read all the books and all the articles and are in action in your life in a way that is not in contradiction to that situation. But I find it a constant struggle because we have built a whole society, as we know, that ignores this. But as we know, it will not be ignorable for long. And by the time we get to the point that it is not ignorable, it is too late. It is baked in. 2020 has to be our peak emission. How we create systemic change, I think, what I have figured out so far, is you go to the area that intersects your passion, whatever it is. We're going to lift a big thing together. We all have to find a place around the table to be able to grab on. Climate is intersectional. Climate justice and land rights and all of that is absolutely part of the climate narrative. And we need to get in. We need to. The only way forward that I see to live with that climate reality in a, and as my reality, as the reality that I'm not blocking or denying when I'm doing my work, is to start working with the organizations that are telling the climate story. Here are the kinds of things that they're coming to me and saying, we need artists on think tanks. We need artists working for activist organizations like David Suzuki Foundation, Nature Conservancy Canada, like spec, you name it. And we need to have artists in residency there. There needs to be art on every press release. There needs to be art at every press conference. There needs to be art attached to every petition. Um, when, I, uh, when I've been talking to DSF, one of the things they said to me is, um, am I taking too much time? Side note. Yeah, OK. Uh, one of the things they said to me is, we have a, um, a clean energy petition. It's got 50,000 signatures in Canada. Can an artist help us to do something with that so that that petition doesn't just slide off a politician's desk and land in the trash? And I was like, yes, it's not hard. That's what we do. Like, that's an amazing dance piece. That's an amazing fine arts piece. That's an amazing yada, yada, yada. If you're attracted to the protest movement, the protest movement needs art. Vancouver's protest movement is like really in need of us. If you're attracted to working with journalists, solutions-based journalism is looking for artists to help tell the climate story. Because art does that thing of all, everything that we're seeing, all this delight, innovation, 
all of the things that attract us in that activate that raccoon sensibility that we have, having opposable thumbs and also interested in shiny things, that we craft the way for people to receive the climate story. Because the people at David Suzuki Foundation are telling me it's just not working what we're doing. Fact-based approach is dead. We need arts-based approach. And that is all over um, environmental organizations in Canada. And I, I think there's room. I also think there's money. I think there's partnerships. And I think they are beating down the door to get to us. They don't know where we live. And we don't know where they live. Like, well, there's a little bit of investigation to do there. But I know that the people in this room, with all of the degrees that are in this room, can find them. And I think it's up to us to go and, and, and open those doors and start those conversations. I want to work with you on your climate communications. Just that simple. Ha 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 ha!